The Legacy of Madness I Never Knew My Uncle He was a distant relative who lived in a faraway country. He never contacted me or my family, and we never bothered to contact him. He was a mystery, a shadow, a name without a face. That's why I was surprised when I received a letter from a lawyer informing me that he had died and that I had inherited his old mansion. The letter said that he had no other living relatives and that he had named me as his sole heir. It also said that he had died under mysterious circumstances and that the police were still investigating his death. I was curious and intrigued by this unexpected news. Who was this uncle? And why did he leave me his mansion? What did he do in his life? And how did he die? What secrets did he hide in his mansion? And what dangers did he face? I decided to visit the mansion, hoping to find some answers. I packed my bags and booked a flight to the country where he lived. I didn't tell anyone about my trip, not even my girlfriend. I wanted to keep this a personal matter, and I didn't want to involve anyone else. I arrived at the airport, where I rented a car and drove to the address that the lawyer had given me. It was a long and lonely drive, through empty roads and barren landscapes. The mansion was located in a remote and isolated area, far from any civilization. It was surrounded by a high wall and a metal gate, which looked old and rusty. I parked my car outside the gate and got out. I looked for a bell or a buzzer, but I couldn't find any. I tried to push the gate open, but it was locked. I wondered how I was supposed to enter the mansion when I heard a voice behind me. Who are you? The voice asked. I turned around and saw a man standing behind me. He was tall and thin, with gray hair and a beard. He wore a black suit and a hat, which made him look like a butler or a caretaker. He had a stern and serious expression on his face, which made me feel uneasy. I'm sorry to bother you, I said politely. I'm here to see the mansion. The mansion? He repeated. What do you want with the mansion? I inherited it from my uncle, I explained. He died recently, and he left me his mansion. Your uncle, he said skeptically. His name was Arthur Blackwood, I said. The man's eyes widened in shock. He took a step back and looked at me with fear and disbelief. Arthur Blackwood, he gasped. Yes, I said. Do you know him? The man nodded slowly. Yes, I know him, he said. I worked for him for many years. I was his caretaker. His caretaker, I said. Then you must know a lot about him. The man shook his head sadly. No, not really, he said. He was a very secretive and eccentric man. He rarely left his mansion, and he never let anyone enter it. He spent most of his time in his basement, where he had his laboratory. His laboratory? I said curiously. What did he do there? The man looked at me with a grave and solemn expression. I don't know exactly, he said, but I know it was something dangerous and unnatural. Something that had to do with occultism and alchemy. Occultism and alchemy, I repeated incredulously. Yes, he said. He was obsessed with them. Did he succeed, I asked. The man shook his head again. No, he didn't, he said. He only unleashed horrors that killed him. Horrors, I said nervously. Yes, he said. Horrors that are still inside the mansion. He looked at me with pity and warning. Listen to me, he said earnestly. You don't want to enter the mansion. You don't want to see what's inside it. You don't want to inherit this legacy of madness. He reached into his pocket and took out a key. Here, he said, handing me the key. This is the key to the gate and the front door of the mansion. Take it if you want, but don't say I didn't warn you. He turned around and walked away. Wait, I called after him. He stopped and looked back at me. My name is Walter, he said. Walter, I repeated. Thank you for your help. He nodded and continued walking. I watched him disappear into the distance. I looked at the key in my hand. I felt a mix of emotions. Curiosity, excitement, fear, doubt. Should I enter the mansion or should I leave it alone? I made up my mind. I inserted the key into the lock and opened the gate. I entered the mansion. I walked through the gate and approached the mansion. 
It was a huge and imposing building with a Gothic style and a dark color. It looked old and neglected with cracked walls and broken windows. It gave me a sense of dread and uneasiness. I reached the front door and used the key to open it. I entered the mansion and closed the door behind me. I found myself in a large and dimly lit hall with a staircase leading to the upper floor and several doors leading to different rooms. The hall was decorated with paintings and statues, which looked dusty and faded. The air was stale and musty, and I could hear the sound of rats scurrying in the walls. I decided to explore the mansion, hoping to find some clues about my uncle and his life. I checked each room, one by one, but I didn't find anything interesting or useful. Most of the rooms were empty or filled with junk, such as old furniture, books, clothes, and papers. Some of the rooms were locked, and I didn't have the keys to open them. I was disappointed and frustrated by my lack of discoveries. I wondered if my uncle had hidden everything in his basement, where he had his laboratory. I remembered what Walter had told me about the basement, and how he had warned me not to enter it. He had said that it was dangerous and unnatural, and that it contained horrors that killed my uncle. I was curious and tempted by his words. What did he mean by horrors? What did my uncle do in his basement? What secrets did he uncover? I decided to ignore Walter's warning and enter the basement. I wanted to see for myself what was inside it. I wanted to inherit this legacy of madness. I went back to the hall and looked for the door to the basement. I found it at the end of the hall, next to a coat rack. It was a wooden door with a metal handle and a padlock. I tried to open it, but it was locked. I searched for the key to the padlock, but I couldn't find it anywhere. I checked my pockets, my bag, the coat rack, but nothing. I wondered where Walter had hidden it. I was determined to enter the basement, so I decided to break the padlock. I looked for something that could help me do that. I saw an umbrella on the coat rack, which had a metal tip. I grabbed it and used it as a lever to pry open the padlock. It took me some effort and time, but I managed to break the padlock. It fell to the floor with a loud clang. I opened the door and saw a staircase leading down to the darkness. I felt a chill run down my spine as I looked at the staircase. It was steep and narrow, with no railing or light. It looked like it led to hell. I hesitated for a moment, wondering if I should go down or not. I made up my mind. I grabbed a flashlight from my bag and turned it on. I went down the staircase. I entered the basement. I reached the bottom of the staircase and entered the basement. It was a large and dark room with a low ceiling and a concrete floor. It was filled with various machines and devices, which looked old and complex. There were wires and tubes running across the walls and the floor, connecting the machines and devices. There were also shelves and cabinets, which contained bottles, jars, books, and papers. I was amazed and bewildered by what I saw. It looked like a laboratory, but not like any laboratory I had ever seen before. It looked like a mixture of science and magic, of logic and madness. I wondered what my uncle did in this laboratory, and what he was trying to achieve. I wondered what kind of experiments he conducted, and what kind of results he obtained. I decided to explore the laboratory, hoping to find some clues about my uncle and his work. I walked around the room examining the machines and devices. Some of them looked familiar, such as a microscope, a centrifuge, and a spectrometer. Others looked unfamiliar, such as a metal sphere with spikes, a glass cylinder with coils, and a wooden box with buttons. I was fascinated by the unfamiliar devices and I wanted to know what they did. I picked one of them, which looked like a radio transmitter, but with strange symbols and wires. It had a switch on its side, which was in the off position. I decided to activate it, hoping to find out what it did. I didn't think it would be dangerous or harmful. I thought it would be harmless or useless. I flipped the switch to the on position. I made a terrible mistake. As soon as I flipped the switch, I heard a loud noise and saw a flash of light. I felt a surge of energy and pain. I realized that I had opened a portal to another dimension, unleashing unspeakable horrors. I screamed in terror and dropped the device. It was too late. 
The horrors were already here. I screamed in terror and dropped the device. It was too late. I looked around and saw them. They were creatures that defied any logic or description. They were twisted and grotesque with shapes and forms that violated the laws of nature. They had eyes, mouths, teeth, claws, tentacles, wings, horns, scales, fur, feathers, and other features that I couldn't identify. They were of different sizes and colors, but they all shared one thing in common. They were hungry and angry. They came out of the portal, which was a hole in the air that emitted a bright and pulsating light. They filled the basement, crawling, flying, jumping, and running towards me. They made noises that chilled my blood, such as hisses, roars, shrieks, and laughs. I was paralyzed with fear and shock. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I couldn't understand what I had done. I had opened a portal to another dimension, unleashing unspeakable horrors. I realized that I had to escape. I had to get out of the basement and out of the mansion. I had to get away from these creatures before they killed me. I grabbed my flashlight and ran towards the staircase. I hoped to reach the door and lock it behind me. I hoped to stop the creatures from following me, but I was too slow and they were too fast. They reached me before I reached the door. They attacked me from all sides. They bit me, scratched me, stabbed me, burned me, poisoned me. They tore me apart. I felt pain beyond any pain I had ever felt before. I felt fear beyond any fear I had ever felt before. I felt regret beyond any regret I had ever felt before. I wished I had never entered the mansion. I wished I had never activated the device. I wished I had never inherited this legacy of madness. I screamed one last time before I died. I screamed one last time before I died, but I didn't die. I woke up. I opened my eyes and saw a white ceiling. I felt a sharp pain in my chest and a cold sweat on my forehead. I realized that I was lying on a bed with wires and tubes attached to my body. I realized that I was in a hospital. I tried to move, but I couldn't. I was paralyzed. I tried to speak, but I couldn't. I was mute. I tried to remember, but I couldn't. I was confused. What had happened to me? Where was I? Who was I? I looked around and saw a window, a door, and a TV. The window was closed, the door was locked, and the TV was on. The TV showed a news report, with a female reporter speaking in a language that I didn't understand. I watched the TV, hoping to find some clues about my situation. I saw images that shocked and horrified me. I saw images of the mansion, the basement, the portal, and the creatures. I saw images of destruction, chaos, and death. The reporter said something that caught my attention. She said the name of my uncle, Arthur Blackwood. She said that he was a spy and a traitor who had been working for a foreign enemy for many years. She said that he had been using his mansion as a secret base, where he had been conducting experiments with occultism and alchemy. She said that he had been trying to create a weapon of mass destruction, capable of opening a portal to another dimension and unleashing unspeakable horrors. She said that he had failed and died in his own experiment, but not before sending a signal that revealed the location of his base and his weapon. She said that the signal had been intercepted by the authorities, who had sent a team of soldiers to investigate and secure the base. She said that the soldiers had arrived at the mansion, where they had found me lying on the floor of the basement, next to the device that had opened portal. She said that they had assumed that I was an accomplice of my uncle, and that they had arrested me and taken me away. She said that they had also tried to close the portal and stop the creatures from escaping, but they had failed. She said that the creatures had spread across the country, attacking and killing anyone they encountered. She said that the country was in a state of emergency and that the authorities were asking for international help. She said that I was in a military hospital where I was being interrogated and tortured. She said that they wanted to know who I was, what I knew, and what I did. She said that they wanted to make me pay for what I had done. She said that I was doomed. I watched the TV with disbelief and horror. 
I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I couldn't believe what I had done. I didn't know who my uncle was or what he did. I didn't know what his device did or how it worked. I didn't know what his signal meant or who it reached. I didn't know anything. I was innocent. But they didn't believe me. They thought I was guilty. They thought I was responsible for this nightmare. They hated me. They wanted me dead. They were going to kill me. I felt a surge of fear and anger. I felt a surge of power and will. I decided to fight back. I decided to escape. I decided to survive. I used all my strength and all my mind to break free from my paralysis and my muteness. I used all my strength and all my mind to break free from the wires and tubes that held me down. I used all my strength and all my mind to break free from the bed and the room that trapped me in. I broke free. I got up from the bed and ran towards the door. I kicked it open and ran out of the room. I ran through the hallways and corridors of the hospital, looking for an exit. I ran past doctors, nurses, soldiers, and guards who tried to stop me or shoot me. I dodged them or knocked them down, using my fists or whatever weapon I could find. I ran until I found an exit. It was a metal door with a sign that said, Emergency Exit. It led to a parking lot with several cars and trucks. It also led to freedom. I opened the door and ran out of the hospital. I ran towards one of the cars, which had its keys in the ignition. It was a black sedan with tinted windows and bulletproof tires. It looked like it belonged to someone important or dangerous. It belonged to me now. I got into the car and started it. I drove out of the parking lot and onto the road. I drove away from the hospital and away from the nightmare. I drove towards a new life. I drove towards a new identity. I drove towards a new legacy. I drove towards madness. I open my eyes and see a white ceiling. I blink and try to focus, but everything is blurry. I feel a sharp pain in my head, and I touch it with my hand. I feel a bandage wrapped around my skull, and I wonder what happened to me. I look around and see that I'm lying in a hospital bed, hooked to some machines and wires. I see a doctor and a nurse standing over me, talking in a low voice. They notice that I am awake, and they smile at me. Hello, Mr. Smith, the doctor says. How are you feeling? I stare at him, confused. Mr. Smith? Who is Mr. Smith? Is that my name? I try to remember, but I can't remember, but I can't. I can't remember anything, not my name, not my face, not my life. I, I don't know, I say with difficulty. Who are you? Where am I? What happened to me? The doctor and the nurse exchange a glance, and then they look at me with pity. You are in the memory recovery center, the doctor says. You have been in a car accident, and you have suffered a severe head injury. You have lost your memory, Mr. Smith. You have amnesia. Amnesia. The word sounds familiar, but I don't know what it means. I feel a surge of fear and panic, and I start to hyperventilate. Amnesia. What do you mean? How can I lose my memory? How can I forget who I am? I ask frantically. The doctor tries to calm me down, and he puts his hand on my shoulder. Please, Mr. Smith, don't worry. You are not alone. There are other people like you here who have also lost their memory due to various reasons. We are here to help you recover your memory, Mr. Smith. We are here to help you remember who you are. He says these words with a gentle tone, but I don't trust him. I don't trust anyone. How do I know that he is telling the truth? How do I know that he is not lying to me? How do I know that he is not trying to manipulate me? He asks me some questions, but I can't answer them. He asks me about my family, my friends, my job, my hobbies, but I don't know anything about them. He shows me some pictures of people who are supposed to be my relatives, but they don't look familiar to me at all. He tells me that he is Dr. Jones and that he is the head of the Memory Recovery Center. He tells me that the nurse is S. Lee, and that she is his assistant. He tells me that they will take good care of me, and that they will take good care of me, and that they will do some tests on me to find out what caused my amnesia. He tells me that I have been in a coma for two weeks. 
and that they have been waiting for me to wake up. He tells me that they have contacted my wife, who is on her way to see me. My wife? Do I have a wife? What is her name? What does she look like? Do I love her? He tells me that her name is Sarah and that she is very worried about me. He tells me that she loves me very much and that she will be happy to see me. Sarah. The name sounds familiar, but I don't know why. Do I really have a wife named Sarah? Do I really love her? He tells me that everything will be all right and that he will explain everything to me later. He tells me that I need to rest now and that he will come back soon. He leaves the room with the nurse and they close the door behind them. I am alone now. I lie on the bed, staring at the ceiling. I feel confused and scared. I don't know who I am. I don't know where I am. I don't know what happened to me. I don't know if I can trust anyone. I don't know if this is real or not. I don't know anything, and I wonder if I will ever remember anything again. I spend the next few days in the hospital, trying to adjust to my new situation. But I feel that something is wrong. Something is very wrong. The hospital is very old and dirty. The walls are cracked and stained, and the floors are dusty and slippery. The lights are dim and flickering, and the air is stale and smelly. There are no windows or clocks in the hospital, and I have no idea what time it is or what day it is. The hospital staff is very strange. They wear white coats and masks, and they hardly talk to me or to each other. They seem cold and distant, and they always watch me with a suspicious look. They give me pills and injections every day, and they tell me that they are for my recovery, but I don't feel any better. I feel worse. The other patients are also strange. They are all suffering from amnesia, like me, and they all wear the same white clothes. They wander around the hospital, looking lost and confused. They try to talk to me, but they don't make any sense. They say things like, who are you? Where are we? What are they doing to us? They seem scared and paranoid, and they often cry or scream. I try to make friends with them, but they don't trust me. They think that I am one of them, or that I am one of them. They think that I am a spy, or a traitor, or a liar. They accuse me of things that I don't remember doing, or things that I don't remember doing, or things that I don't understand. They say things like, you killed him. You betrayed us. You lied to us. They say things like, you are not Mr. Smith. You are not my husband. You are not my friend. They say things that make me doubt myself. Who am I? Who is Mr. Smith? Who is my wife? Who is my friend? I don't know. I don't know anything. And I wonder if they know something that I don't. I also see some strange machines and devices in the corridors of the hospital. They look like torture instruments or weapons of war. They have wires and needles and blades and electrodes. They make noises and sparks flashes. They scare me. I hear screams and noises coming from the basement of the hospital. They sound like pain and fear and anger. They haunt me. I wonder what is going on in this hospital. What are they doing to us? What are they hiding from us? What are they planning for us? I don't know. I don't know anything, and I wonder if I will ever find out anything again. I can't stay in this hospital any longer. I have to escape. I have to find out the truth. I have a feeling that they are lying to me. That they are not trying to help me, but to harm me. That they are not my friends, but my enemies. I have a feeling that this hospital is not a hospital, but a prison. A prison where they keep us locked up and experiment on us. A prison where they try to erase our memories and change our personalities. I have a feeling that I am in danger. That they are planning something terrible for me. That they are going to kill me. I have to escape. But how? I don't know the way out. I don't know where I am. I don't know who I can trust. I need help. And then I meet her. She is a woman who claims to be my wife. She says that her name is Sarah and that she is here to rescue me. 
She says that she has been looking for me for a long time and that she finally found me. She says that we were both kidnapped by the hospital staff who are conducting experiments on us. She says that they have implanted chips in our brains that control our thoughts and actions. She says that they have been lying to us all along and that we are not their spouses, but their enemies. She says that we have to find a way out before they lose their minds. She says that she has found a map of the hospital and a key to the exit door. She says that we have to work together and to avoid the guards and the cameras. She says that she loves me very much and that she will never leave me again. She says all these things with a convincing tone and she shows me the map and the key. She looks familiar, but I don't remember her. Do I really have a wife named Sarah? Do I really love her? I don't know, but I have no choice. I have to trust her. I have to escape with her. We wait until nightfall, when the hospital is quiet and dark. We sneak out of our rooms and we follow the map. We avoid the corridors where there are guards and cameras, and we take the stairs instead of the elevator. We move fast and silent, like shadows. We reach the basement, where the exit door is supposed to be. We see a metal door with a sign that says emergency exit. We insert the key into the lock, and we turn it. The door opens with a click. We are free. We run outside, into the night. We breathe the fresh air, and we feel the wind on our faces. We look at the stars, and we smile at each other. We did it. We escaped. We are free. But are we? Are we really free? Or are we still trapped? Trapped in our own minds? Trapped in our own lies? Trapped in our own madness? I don't know. I don't know anything. And I wonder if I will ever know anything again. We run outside, into the night. We think that we are free, but we are wrong. We hear a loud noise behind us, and we turn around. We see the doctor and the nurse, who are holding guns. They point them at us, and they tell us to stop. We freeze, and we feel a cold sweat on our foreheads. What are you doing? Sarah asks in a trembling voice. Why are you pointing guns at us? The doctor and the nurse smile, but their smiles are cruel and mocking. Did you really think that you could escape? The doctor says. Did you really think that we would let you go? What are you talking about? I ask, confused. Who are you? What do you want from us? The doctor and the nurse laugh, and they shake their heads. You are so naive, Mr. Smith, the doctor says. Or should I say, Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones? What does he mean by that? You see, Mr. Smith is not your real name, the doctor continues. It is a fake name that we gave you, to make you believe that you are someone else. Someone else, I repeat, stunned. What do you mean by that? The doctor and the nurse exchange a glance, and then they look at me with contempt. You are not a patient in this hospital, Mr. Jones, the doctor says. You are a prisoner. A prisoner? I echo, incredulous. A prisoner of what? A prisoner of a project, the doctor says. A project that aims to create a new race of humans who have no memories or emotions. A new race of humans, Sarah says. Horrified, the doctor and the nurse nod, and they explain. You are part of an experiment, Mr. Jones, the doctor says. An experiment that tries to erase your memory and replace it with a new one. A new one, I say, bewildered. Why would you do that? Because we want to create a new type of human being, the doctor says. A human being who has no past, no identity, no personality. A human being who has no feelings, no attachments, no loyalties. A human being who has no will, no conscience, no morality. A human being who is obedient, loyal, and efficient. A human being who is perfect for our purpose purposes, Sarah says, scared. Purposes that you don't need to know, the doctor says. Purposes that are beyond your comprehension. The doctor and the nurse smirk and they reveal more. You see, Mr. Jones, the doctor says, you are not just a prisoner of this project. You are also an enemy of this project. An enemy, I say, confused. How can I be an enemy? 
Because you were a spy, the doctor says. A spy who infiltrated our organization and tried to expose our secrets. A spy? I say, shocked. I was a spy. Yes, you were, the doctor says. You were a spy for the CI. The CI? I say, baffled. What is the CIA? The CIA is an intelligence agency of the United States of America, the doctor says. A country that is opposed to our goals and interests. A country? I say, perplexed. The doctor and the nurse sigh, and they shake their heads. You really don't remember anything, do you? The doctor says. You don't remember who you are or what you did? No, I say, honestly. I don't remember anything. That's because we erased your memory, the doctor says. We implanted a chip in your brain that controls your thoughts and actions. A chip? I say, alarmed. You implanted a chip in my brain? Yes, we did, the doctor says. And we can activate it anytime we want. He shows me a remote control in his hand, and he presses a button. I feel a jolt of pain in my head, and I scream. That's what happens when we activate your chip the doctor says. We can make you feel pain or pleasure, fear or calmness, anger or happiness. We can make you do anything we want. He presses another button, and I feel a wave of calmness wash over me. That's what happens when we deactivate your chip, the doctor says. We can make you forget everything that happened to you. He presses another button, and I feel a flash of memory in my mind. I see myself in a car, driving fast on a highway. I see myself talking on a phone, saying that I have found the location of the project. I see myself being chased by a black van, shooting at me. I see myself crashing into a tree and losing consciousness. I see myself being dragged out of the car and taken to the hospital. I see myself being operated on and having a chip implanted in my brain. I see myself waking up in a hospital bed with no memory of who I am or what happened to me. I see myself meeting Sarah, who claims to be my wife. I see myself escaping from the hospital with Sarah. I see myself being confronted by the doctor and the nurse, who tell me the truth. I see everything that happened to me, and I remember everything. I remember who I am. I remember what I did. I remember why I am here. I am a spy. I am an enemy. I am a prisoner and I am in trouble. The doctor and the nurse smile, and they point their guns at me and Sarah. You can't leave Mr. Jones, the doctor says. You can't escape from us. You can't escape from yourself. He pulls the trigger and shoots me. As the sedative's embrace tightened around me, I was dragged into the murky depths of my own mind. Shadows danced in the corners of my vision, and I could hear the whispers of my fragmented thoughts. The doctor's voices grew distant, distorted, as if they were speaking to me from another dimension. I tried to claw my way back to reality, to escape this nightmarish descent into the abyss of my mind. But it was futile. The sedative's grip was unrelenting, and I was powerless to resist it. In the depths of my consciousness, I was confronted by a haunting truth. The hospital, the experiments, the escape. It had all been a delusion a fabrication of my fractured mind, a desperate attempt to make sense of the chaos that had consumed me. I had created a world of paranoia, espionage, and danger, a world in which I was the hero, the spy, the savior. But in reality, I was none of those things. I was a man lost in the labyrinth of his own madness. As I descended further into the abyss, memories resurfaced like phantoms, fragments of my past, Distorted and disjointed flashed before my eyes. I saw glimpses of a childhood playground, a family gathering, a high school graduation, all tainted by the darkness that had taken hold of me. I saw the faces of people I had once known and loved. Friends, family, and Sarah. The real Sarah, not the figment of my imagination that had led me to this madness. I saw the pain and confusion in their eyes as they watched me spiral into the depths of my own psychosis. And then, as I reached the nadir of my descent, a revelation struck me with bone-chilling force. The doctors were right. I was not Mr. Jones. 
I was not a spy. I was not an enemy. I was not a prisoner. I was a victim of my own mind, of a condition I could not control. The paranoia, the delusions, the fabricated reality, it was all a product of my illness, my schizophrenia. Tears welled up in my eyes as I faced the horrifying truth. I had killed one of the doctors in my delusional state. I had taken a life, and I was now irreversibly trapped in a nightmare of my own making. The doctors' voices, distorted and distant, returned to my awareness. They were speaking urgently, trying to rouse me from the depths of my psychosis. But it was too late. I was lost in the labyrinth of my own mind, forever entangled in the web of my madness. As the sedative continued to pull me deeper into the abyss, I saw a flicker of movement in the darkness. A shadowy figure emerged, its features obscured by the shroud of my delusions. It whispered to me, its voice chilling blend of menace and sorrow. Welcome to your new reality, it hissed. A world of eternal darkness where the mind is both sanctuary and prison. You are lost, Mr. Jones. Lost in the labyrinth of your own making. With those haunting words, the figure faded into the darkness, leaving me to confront the horrifying truth of my existence. I was condemned to wander the twisted corridors of my own mind, forever haunted by the specters of my delusions. And as the sedative finally claimed my consciousness, I knew that there would be no escape from the horrors that awaited me in the mind's abyss. I can't sleep. I haven't slept for days. I don't know why. I don't have any medical condition, or any psychological problem, or any stress, or any trauma. I just can't sleep. I lie in bed every night, staring at the ceiling, counting sheep, listening to music, reading books, watching movies, doing anything to make me fall asleep. But nothing works. I stay awake until dawn, and then I get up and go to work. I work as a journalist for a local newspaper. It's not a very exciting or rewarding job, but it pays the bills. I write about mundane and trivial things, such as politics, sports, weather, and crime. I don't have any passion or creativity for my work. I just do it because I have to. I don't have any friends or colleagues who care about me. I don't have any family or relatives who support me. I don't have any hobbies or interests that entertain me. I don't have anything that makes me happy. I only have insomnia. Insomnia that affects my health, my work, and my relationship. Insomnia that makes me tired, irritable, and depressed. The nightmare pill. Insomnia that makes me miserable. I'm desperate to find a solution. I've tried everything. Pills, herbs, teas, meditation, hypnosis, acupuncture, therapy. But nothing works. Nothing helps me sleep until I hear about a new sleeping pill. A sleeping pill that promises to induce lucid dreams. Lucid dreams are dreams in which you are aware that you are dreaming and you can control your actions and your environment. Lucid dreams are supposed to be fun and enjoyable and they can also help you overcome your fears and problems. I've always wanted to have lucid dreams. I've always wanted to escape from my boring and unhappy reality and enter a world of fantasy and adventure. A world where I can do anything I want and be anyone I want. A world where I can sleep. So I decide to try the new sleeping pill. I buy it from a shady online seller who claims that it is safe and effective. He says that it is a revolutionary product based on cutting edge research and technology. He says that it is a miracle cure for insomnia and other sleep disorders. He says that it is the best thing that ever happened to me. He doesn't say anything about the side effects. He doesn't say anything about the risks. He doesn't say anything about the nightmare world. I took the pill and went to bed. I closed my eyes and waited for the pill to take effect. I hoped that it would help me sleep and dream. It did. I fell asleep and entered a dream world. A dream world where I was aware that I was dreaming and I could control my actions and my environment. 
a dream world where I could do anything I wanted and be anyone I wanted. A dream world where I could have fun and enjoy myself. I loved it. I explored the dream world and I created my own scenarios and adventures. I flew in the sky, swam in the ocean, climbed mountains, and visited exotic places. I met celebrities, heroes, villains, and characters from my favorite books and movies. I had conversations, friendships, romances, and conflicts with them. I experienced emotions, sensations, and memories that I had never felt before. I was happy. I didn't realize that the pill had a side effect. I didn't realize that it trapped me in the dream world and I couldn't wake up. I fell asleep and entered a dream world. A dream world where I was aware that I was dreaming and I could control my actions and my environment. A dream world where I could do anything I wanted and be anyone I wanted. A dream world where I could have fun and enjoy myself. But it didn't last. My dream world turned into a nightmare world. A nightmare world where I was hunted by my worst fears. A nightmare world where I faced my phobias, my regrets, my guilt, and my enemies. A nightmare world where I couldn't escape or fight back or lucid dream. I hated it. I was trapped in the nightmare world, and I had to endure the horrors that awaited me. I had to face the things that scared me the most, and the things that hurt me the most. I had to face the things that I wanted to forget, and the things that I wanted to forget, and the things that I wanted to change. I had to face myself. I faced my fear of heights when I found myself on top of a skyscraper with no way down. I faced my fear of spiders when I was surrounded by giant arachnids with venomous fangs. I faced my fear of drowning when I was submerged in a dark and deep ocean with no air. I faced my regret of losing my parents when I saw them die in a car crash over and over again. I faced my regret of dropping out of college when I saw how successful and happy my classmates were. I faced my regret of cheating on my girlfriend when I saw how much she loved me and how much she hated me. I faced my guilt of lying to my boss when he fired me for stealing his money. I faced my guilt of hurting my friend when he confronted me for betraying his trust. I faced my guilt of killing a man when he begged me for mercy. I faced my enemies from the past who bullied me, abused me, or threatened me. I faced my enemies from the present who hated me, envied me, or competed with me. I faced my enemies from the future who wanted to destroy me, enslave me, or replace me. I faced them all. And they all tortured me. They all made me suffer. They all made me wish I was dead. But I, I couldn't die. I couldn't wake up. I was stuck in the nightmare world. And it was all because of the pill. I woke up with a jolt. I felt a sharp pain in my chest and a cold sweat on my forehead. I looked around and saw that I was in a hospital room with wires and tubes attached to my body. I saw a monitor that showed my vital signs and a camera that watched my every move. I tried to remember what had happened. I remembered taking the pill and falling asleep. I remembered entering the dream world and having fun. I remembered the dream world turning into a nightmare world and being hunted by my fears. But I didn't remember waking up. I didn't remember how I got here. I didn't remember why I was here. I was confused and scared. I wanted to get out of here. I wanted to go back to the dream world. I wanted to go back to the nightmare world. Anything was better than this reality, but I couldn't. I was stuck here, and I was not alone. I heard a knock on the door, and then it opened. A man walked in, wearing a white coat and a badge. He had a clipboard in his hand and a smile on his face. He looked like a doctor, but he was not. He was an agent an agent of the organization that had created the pill and the dream world, an agent of the organization that had trapped me in this reality. He came closer to me and spoke in a friendly tone. Hello, Mr. Smith. How are you feeling today? I didn't answer. I didn't know who he was or what he wanted from me. I didn't know if he was telling me the truth or lying to me. I didn't know if he was here to help me or hurt me. 
I didn't trust him. He continued to talk, as if he didn't notice my silence. I'm Dr. Jones, and I'm here to explain everything to you. You see, you are part of a very important experiment, one that could change the world. You are one of the lucky few who have been chosen to test a new product, a product that can induce lucid dreams. He paused and smiled, as if he expected me to be impressed or grateful. I wasn't. I was angry and disgusted. He went on with his speech, oblivious to my feelings. This product is called ELD50, and it is a revolutionary breakthrough in the field of neuroscience and psychology. It is a pill that can activate a hidden part of your brain, a part that can access another reality, a part that can access another reality, a reality where your dreams are real and have consequences. He paused again and looked at me with curiosity and pity. Do you understand what I'm saying? I did understand, and I wished I didn't. He explained everything to me. He explained that the pill was not a sleeping pill, but a gateway to another reality. He explained that the dream world was not a dream world, but another reality. He explained that the nightmare world was not a nightmare world, but another reality. He explained that every time I died in my dreams, I lost a part of my soul. He explained that every time I killed someone in my dreams, I killed them in reality. He explained that I had killed several people in my dreams, who were actually real people in another reality. He explained that I had committed multiple murders without even knowing it. He explained that I was doomed. I sat in the sterile hospital room my mind reeling from the shocking revelation Dr. Jones had just delivered. The eld 50 pill had been nothing but a gateway to a twisted reality, a nightmare realm where my dreams were not just figments of my imagination, but had real and horrifying consequences. My heart raced as I tried to process the implications of what Dr. Jones had told me. I was a murderer in another reality, unknowingly taking innocent lives with every horrific act committed in my lucid dreams. The weight of guilt and horror pressed upon me, threatening to suffocate me. Dr. Jones continued to speak, his voice a haunting echo in my ears. You see, Mr. Smith, you're not alone in this. There are others like you, trapped in the same waking nightmare. The organization I represent has been conducting these experiments for years, selecting individuals like you to test the boundaries of reality and the human mind. My mind swirled with questions and doubts, but one thing became painfully clear. I was ensnared in a malevolent experiment beyond my control. The guilt and fear intensified, threatening to consume me. We have been monitoring your progress closely, Dr. Jones said, leaning in with a chilling smile. Your experiences in the dream world have been invaluable to our research. The emotions, the actions, the actions, the consequences, all of it has provided us with invaluable data. My heart pounded in my chest, and I couldn't hold back the rising sense of dread. What? What? Dr. Jones' smile widened, revealing a sinister glint in his eyes. We want to see how far you're willing to go, Mr. Smith. How deep into the abyss of your own mind you can descend. How much guilt and despair you can endure. The realization struck me like a bolt of lightning. I was nothing more than a pawn in their sadistic game, a tool to push the boundaries of human experience, to explore the depths of despair. As Dr. Jones continued to speak, his words became a nightmarish cacophony, a symphony of madness that threatened to drown me. He spoke of the pain and suffering I had unknowingly inflicted upon others in that twisted reality. He spoke of the torment and despair that awaited me as I spiraled further into the abyss. The room grew darker, and the walls seemed to close in on me. The monitor displaying my vital signs flickered ominously, and I realized that there was no escape from this waking nightmare. I had to find a way out. With trembling hands, I reached for the wires and tubes that bound me to the hospital bed. I pulled them free, ignoring the alarms that blared to life. Panic and desperation fueled my actions as I stumbled to my feet. Dr. Jones' voice grew louder and more menacing, but I couldn't bear to hear any more of his cruel revelations. I had to escape. 
had to break free from this nightmarish trap. I rushed towards the door, but as I reached for the handle, it turned on its own. The door swung open, revealing a corridor that seemed to stretch infinitely into darkness. Dr. Jones' voice echoed from behind me, mocking my futile attempt at escape. I stepped into the corridor, my footsteps echoing in the eerie silence. The walls seemed to shift and contort, taking on grotesque forms that danced on the edge of perception. Whispers filled the air, indistinct and foreboding. As I ventured further into the endless corridor, I realized that there was no way out. I was trapped in a never-ending nightmare, a labyrinth of despair and horror. The boundaries between reality and madness blurred, and I knew that I had become a permanent resident of this twisted realm. The nightmares continued, relentless and unending. I was haunted by the faces of those I had unknowingly harmed, tormented by the guilt that threatened to consume me. Dr. Jones' laughter echoed in the distance, a cruel reminder of the malevolent forces that controlled my fate. In the end, there was no escape, no redemption. I was condemned to wander the corridors of my own mind, forever lost in a waking nightmare. The story of my life had become a never-ending horror, a torment from which there was no release. And as the darkness closed in around me, I knew that I would never wake up from this living nightmare. The cityscape buzzed with the frenetic energy of urban life. But amidst the cacophony of car horns and chatter, there existed a whisper, a faint echo from the depths of history. It was a rumor, a tale spun from the threads of legend. One that called to me like an irresistible siren song. I first heard of the treasure in a dimly lit smoke-filled tavern, where adventurers and fortune, seekers gathered to swap stories of their daring escapades. The air was thick with the scent of aged whiskey and the voices of those who had gazed into the abyss and lived to tell the tale. As I nursed my drink, a grizzled old explorer named Captain Rourke leaned across the scarred wooden table, his eyes glittering with the excitement of a long-held secret. He spoke of a treasure hidden in the heart of a jungle untouched by civilization, a place where the laws of man held no sway and the line between myth and reality blurred. They say it's cursed, Rourke rasped, his voice a gravelly whisper that sent shivers down my spine. But that treasure, it's beyond imagination, beyond reckoning, enough to change a man's fate or doom him forever. Intrigued and driven by avarice, I delved deeper into the lore of this hidden trove. The legend spoke of a jungle, where trees whispered secrets to the wind, where the very earth itself seemed to writhe with an unnatural energy. It was a place teeming with wildlife, yet devoid of human life, a testament to the ominous aura that enveloped it. The treasure, they said, was guarded by vengeful spirits and malevolent forces, left behind by those who had failed to claim it. The tales were filled with accounts of lost expeditions, adventurers who adventurers who adventured into the jungle never to return, their fate sealed by the curse that clung to the riches. But the lure of wealth was a siren that called to me, and I couldn't resist its song. I began to assemble a group of like-minded individuals, each driven by their own desires and haunted by their own demons. Together, we would embark on a journey into the heart of the cursed jungle, risking everything for the chance to claim the legendary treasure that lay hidden within its depths. As the sun dipped below the horizon that evening, Casting long shadows across the tavern, I couldn't help but feel a foreboding chill crawl up my spine. The call of legends had beckoned, and I had answered. Little did I know the horrors that awaited us in the cursed jungle, or the darkness that would descend upon our souls as we ventured deeper into the unknown. The jungle swallowed us whole, its oppressive greenery a constant reminder of our isolation from the world we had left behind. The air was thick with humidity, and every breath was a struggle against the relentless heat. Mosquitoes and other insects feasted upon our exposed skin, leaving it marked with angry red welts. Our expedition was comprised of individuals from diverse backgrounds, each with their own reasons for joining this perilous quest. 
There was Dr. Evelyn Stone, an esteemed archaeologist whose thirst for knowledge had led her to this forsaken place. Her sharp intellect and unwavering determination made her a pillar of strength in our group. Then there was Marcus, a rugged survivalist who had spent years in the wilderness. His gruff exterior hit a wealth of knowledge about the jungle's flora and fauna, knowledge that was becoming increasingly vital with each step we took. As for myself, I was driven by the allure of wealth and the desire to escape the mundane life I had led for far too long. The jungle, with its legends and curses, offered an escape from the monotony of my existence. Our journey had begun with excitement and anticipation. But as the days turned into weeks, the jungle began to reveal its true nature. The undergrowth grew thicker, forming an impenetrable wall of vegetation that seemed to close in around us. Vines snaked down from the towering trees above, creating a labyrinth that disoriented even the most experienced among us. Strange noises filled the air, a cacophony of chirps, clicks, and rustling leaves. We were not alone in this forsaken place, and that knowledge weighed heavily on our minds. Eyes, gleaming with an otherworldly intelligence, watched us from the shadows, always just beyond the reach of our torchlight. Fear gnawed at the edges of our sanity, and doubt crept into our thoughts. Were we chasing a mirage, a legend spun from the fantasies of desperate souls, or was there truly a treasure hidden in this cursed realm, waiting for those who dared to claim it? Despite our growing unease, we pressed on. The jungle seemed to taunt us, offering glimpses of hidden paths one moment and closing them off the next. It was as if the very landscape itself conspired against our progress. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows that danced in the torchlight, I couldn't help but wonder if we had made a grave mistake. The legends of this place were not to be taken lightly, and with each step we took deeper into the abyss. It felt as though we were descending further into madness itself. The bonds that had held our group together began to fray with each passing day in the unforgiving jungle. Dr. Evelyn Stone, once a beacon of unwavering determination, now wore a haunted expression that mirrored our own growing dread. Marcus, the survivalist, became more withdrawn, his usually stern face etched with worry. It was during the restless nights, as we huddled together around our dwindling campfire, that the true horrors of the jungle unveiled themselves. Unearthly cries echoed through the darkness, chilling us to the bone. Shadows moved in the periphery of our vision, and whispers in a language foreign to our ears filled the air. I tried to dismiss these eerie occurrences as mere products of an overactive imagination, but doubt gnawed at me. Were these supernatural manifestations real? Or had the jungle's oppressive atmosphere finally pushed us to the brink of madness? One evening, as we set up camp near a small, stagnant pond, the jungle's malevolence descended upon us with renewed fervor. Strange symbols appeared etched into the trees surrounding our makeshift shelter, symbols that no human hand could have created. The air grew heavy with an unnatural stillness and our attempts at conversation were met with an unsettling silence. It was then that Dr. Stone made a chilling discovery. She stumbled upon a weathered journal buried beneath a tangle of roots, its pages filled with the desperate scribblings of a previous expedition. The entries spoke of a malevolent presence that haunted the jungle, a vengeful spirit that sought to punish all who dared to seek the treasure it guarded. As we pored over the journal's contents, a sense of unease settled over us. It was not only the jungle's physical dangers that threatened our lives, but a supernatural force that defied reason. The legends were not mere stories. They were a warning from those who had ventured here before us. The journal's author had scrawled a chilling conclusion. There is no escape from this cursed realm. It hungers for our souls, and it will not rest until it claims them. With trembling hands, we made the fateful decision to press on. Driven by a mix of greed and desperation, the jungle had become our prison, and the horrors that lurked within its depths were our captors. As we continued our descent into madness, 
the line between reality and nightmare blurred, and our fears took on tangible form. In the heart of the jungle, the call of legends had become a haunting melody, luring us further into the abyss. The discovery of the treasure was both a blessing and a curse. We had ventured deep into the heart of the jungle, our bodies battered, and our minds on the brink of collapse. The weight of legends pressed upon us, but we pressed on, driven by a relentless desire for riches. It was Marcus who stumbled upon it, a glint of gold hidden beneath a tangle of vines and foliage. The moment we laid eyes on the ancient chest, our exhaustion and fear seemed to vanish, replaced by a feverish excitement. The treasure was real, and it was within our grasp. As we pried the chest open, our elation turned to awe. Jewels of unimaginable value, intricate artifacts, and precious metals spilled forth, gleaming in the dappled sunlight. It was a sight to behold, a testament to the legends that had drawn us here. But as we marveled at our newfound wealth, a heavy silence settled over our group. Greed, like a shadow, crept among us, casting doubt upon our camaraderie. The allure of the treasure was undeniable, and the prospect of unimaginable wealth strained the bonds that had held us together thus far. Dr. Stone, her eyes gleaming with avarice, suggested that we divide the spoils evenly among ourselves. But her words were met with skepticism. A sinister tension simmered beneath the surface of our interactions. Suspicion and paranoia festered, and the once unbreakable trust between us began to fracture. The jungle's relentless assault on our sanity had left its mark, and we regarded each other with growing unease. As we made camp near the treasure site, the encroaching darkness seemed to awaken the jungle's malevolence. Whispers filled the night air, carrying with them a sense of foreboding. Shadows danced in the periphery of our vision, and the symbols etched into the trees appeared to writhe and twist as if imbued with life. It was during one fateful night that our bonds shattered completely. A heated argument erupted over the division of the treasure. Accusations of greed and betrayal were hurled, and fists flew in the darkness. In the end, Dr. Stone lay unconscious, her face marred by a deep gash, and Marcus, his survival instincts taking over had disappeared into the jungle, taking a sizable portion of the treasure with him. The remaining members of our group, their faces twisted with guilt and anger, turned their accusing gazes upon me. They believed I had instigated the violence, and perhaps in the grip of madness, I couldn't be certain if they were wrong. In the aftermath of the confrontation, I found myself alone with the cursed treasure. My companions gone, and the jungle closing in around me. The treasure that had once held the promise of untold riches now felt like a curse, a malevolent force that had torn us apart. I could no longer discern reality from the nightmares that plagued my every waking moment. The jungle's horrors had left their mark, and I was a broken, haunted shell of my former self. In the darkness, I made a decision one born of desperation and a desire to escape the jungle's relentless grip. I would take the cursed treasure with me, away from this accursed place. But as I made my way through the treacherous terrain, a chilling realization settled upon me. The jungle would not let me leave so easily. The legends had spoken of a malevolent presence that guarded the treasure, a vengeful spirit that hungered for souls. And now, as I ventured deeper into the jungle, I could feel its malevolence closing in around me. The treasure had bound me to this cursed realm, and there was no escape. My mind, fractured and tormented, could no longer distinguish between reality and delusion. The shadows whispered secrets, and the symbols etched into the trees seemed to mock my futile attempts to flee. The jungle's relentless horrors pursued me. A relentless, unforgiving force that would not rest until it claimed me. In the heart of the jungle, amidst the shattered bonds of friendship and the weight of the cursed treasure, I was truly alone, haunted by my own actions and the darkness that surrounded me. In the heart of the jungle, I found myself alone, the cursed treasure, now my only companion. 
The weight of my comrades' memories bore down upon me like a leaden shroud, and the once enticing riches had transformed into a burden too heavy to bear. As days turned into weeks, I wrestled with guilt and remorse, haunted by the shattered bonds and the violence that had torn our group asunder. The jungle's relentless horrors continued to close in, their malevolent presence an ever-present reminder of our ill-fated expedition. The treasure, once a symbol of untold wealth, now felt like a curse, a malignant force that had driven us to madness and despair. I couldn't escape the feeling that it was the treasure itself that had torn us apart, that its allure had been a siren song luring us to our doom. In the darkness of my solitude, I made a decision, a fateful one that I hoped would bring closure to our cursed journey. I would leave the treasure behind, buried deep within the jungle, a final act of atonement for the sins we had committed. With trembling hands, I dug a grave for the cursed riches, the very act of doing so feeling like a penance for my greed and ambition. The earth seemed to resist my efforts, as if it too was reluctant to accept the burden of the treasure. But I pressed on, driven by a desperate need to cleanse myself of the guilt that gnawed at my soul. As I covered the treasure with dirt and leaves, a sense of relief washed over me. It was as if the jungle itself approved of my decision, the whispers in the night growing fainter, the shadows less menacing. But as I turned to leave, a bone-chilling realization struck me. My actions had awakened something ancient and vengeful. The jungle came alive with a fury I had not witnessed before. Trees shook with unnatural force, and the very ground beneath me trembled. I felt the eyes of unseen entities upon me, their anger palpable. It was as if the jungle itself sought retribution for my attempt to rid it of the cursed treasure. In my panic, I stumbled and fell, my hands coming into contact with the soil that now covered the riches. A searing pain coursed through me, and I knew with horrifying clarity that the jungle's malevolence had claimed me. The treasure had bound me to this cursed realm, and I was now part of its malevolent design. As the jungle closed in around me, its horrors more tangible than ever, I understood the terrible truth. I would never escape this cursed place. My comrades' memories and the weight of my guilt would be my eternal companions, a haunting reminder of our ill-fated expedition. In the end, I had become a part of the legends that had drawn us here, a cautionary tale of greed and ambition. The treasure I had sought had cost me everything, my friends, my sanity, and ultimately, my very soul. Thanks for listening. If you like the story, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, and I look forward to your comments. See you in the next video.